When I think about our faith, you know, we don't have to make a situation make sense. We simply have to believe that God is who He says He is. Yeah. And the promise that He made in His Word is that He'll work all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Everything that we go through can be used. Yeah. I think every bit, every piece of my life can be used, you know, to help and to, you know, minister to, to someone else. I've had several opportunities to question, yeah. like, God, where are you? But I think as I began to grow in the Word, I realized that I needed to ask myself that. Mm -hmm. Like, where am I? Yes. Because I knew God was present with me. That's great. But I needed to locate me. What did I believe? Mm -hmm. What did I want to see even take place or happen in my yeah. life? And if I was willing to even allow what God had for me to take place. Yes. You know, because sometimes when it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen, yeah. Now we yeah. discredit the fact that God has been there with us the yeah. whole time. Yeah. But I've had, I mean, even in my marriage, I've been married for 40 years now. And it's like those first seven or eight years, I questioned God a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was a new believer. I just got saved for the third time. Yeah. yeah this yeah. one really hit. It this worked. This was the one that stuck. This is the this one that yeah. hit. But <laughs> after that, I consider myself as a new believer and I was so excited about my walk and my relationship with the Word and with God, and then to see my relationship in marriage not being what I pictured it as being, mm -hmm. it, it was like I was devastated. I'm like, this whole God thing doesn't work. And yeah. then I got a word that it wasn't that I was waiting on God to do something. I needed to change my own perspective as far as my relationship wow, yeah. and as the word was concerned, because I didn't come out of that environment. So I only could produce what I had come out of. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I began to do. I have seen the hand of God put so many pieces of, of my life together, you know, because at times you may feel like you're all over the place. And I felt like I was all over the place. But when I begin to trust God and I begin to see who I happen to be in His Word, who He created me to be, that's when all of the pieces of my life, good and bad, begin to come together. And now I can use those pieces to minister to others. I don't remember the exact terminology, but in the social sciences, there's this concept of like narrative bias, which mm -hmm. is the idea that, you know, when you look back on a situation, you basically try to make it fit a certain narrative, mm -hmm. right? Like you try to make it make sense according to what you thought of the situation. And um, when I think about our faith, you know, we don't have to make a situation make sense. We simply have to believe that God is who he says he is. Yeah. And the promise that he made in his word is that he'll work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I know sometimes people who don't have faith will discount this idea of redemption yeah. because mm -hmm. they'll be like, well, sure. of course you would want to make it seem like it was yeah. a good thing right. when it was really a bad right. thing. And it's like, no, my God made me a promise. Mm -hmm. And even when I don't understand, it doesn't make sense in the moment. I can trust and believe that it's going to make sense. And I may not understand it in the land of the living, right. mm -hmm. but even when I get to glory, it'll mm -hmm. make sense. I was thinking about um, my third pregnancy ended in uh, stillbirth. I had to deliver wow. my son, mm -hmm. Daniel, at 20 weeks. Oh, and so um, before him, my oldest wow. son, my current my oldest son, he was born at 26 weeks and he was given like a 50-50 chance of living Super traumatic experience. We did not know why he was born that early. Um, but after delivering my son Daniel and the doctors examined me, what they found out is that I had a condition called incompetent cervix. And so as my babies would grow, my cervix wouldn't be able to support the weight. Wow. And so that's why it would open. And because of that information, wow. I was able to carry my next pregnancy to term. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, in the moment, of course it's devastating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's painful. I cried. We prayed. We asked God, Lord, save our son. We did all the things and it didn't happen. And at the same time, I knew that even though it didn't feel good, I knew God would make it good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I look at my youngest son now and I see in him, I see redemption. Mm -hmm. I see redemption. And I also know that I will see Daniel. Of course. Like I have that, mm -hmm. I have that assurance. Mm -hmm. I will see my son. And so God is faithful. His promise is assured. That's and I right. think 
I think we have to learn to just rest in that. Mm -hmm. When tragedy strikes, when disappointments happen, when mm -hmm. discouragement mm -hmm. meets us at our front door, we have to know that our God yes. yeah. will work all things together for our good. And yeah. I think that's what gives the peace to navigate yeah. The trial. Which is also important what Elise was saying that I think you draw on the faithfulness that you've seen yeah. Yeah. But in the past, over, in the past exactly. because when we talk about a life of faith, I mean, it is it's strange yeah. to somebody who doesn't believe because you're what do you it what are you make putting sense. your hope in? Right. But when we can recount even all the way back to the word, all the ways that God's been faithful then you have this foundation yeah. that says, yeah. I, my God did then, so I know He yeah. will now. Yeah. I want to remind you about in Hebrews when it says that the Lord will never leave you or forsake you. That's a promise that He gave because I believe He knew that life would throw us some curveballs, and He needed to give us reassurance through His Word. So here I am assuming, though, that as a believer, you believe in His Word. That's the first thing you have to ask yourself, do I really believe everything that's written in this book? Because if you do, when He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, when you don't feel Him, that is where faith comes in. We often talk about being people of faith, but is it faith if we always feel Him, if we always see His hand, if we always know that everything is working for good, that everything is working as we planned? Some of our faith is only activated when we don't feel Him, when we don't understand the plan, and when the disappointments come. So let me encourage you, don't let this this moment of disappointment be where you turn your back on God because you think He's turned His back on you. No, lean in and embrace His promise that He's there, He has not forsaken you, and He will always be there for you. No matter what, He is there, even if you don't feel it at this moment. When memories of your past try to hold you down and hold you back and keep you in bondage, God has given us a way to respond. He has told us over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, to cast down every imagination and high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and to bring every thought into captivity. So you know that thought did not come from God, so cast it down. When your past try to control you or dictate to you where your future should be, Cast it down so you can be free. If you feel unqualified to be used by God because of your past, I think one of the biggest things I want you to know is kind of like join the club. I think all of us have had a moment when we look back on our life, on our past, that we realize, I wish I could do that differently, or I did not obey God in that area. But honestly, Look through the Bible and who do you see that didn't have a moment like that? We've got Abraham, Noah, Rahab, David. Look at anyone that was used by God and they all have messy pasts. Don't even get me started on Saul turned to Paul. I mean, that guy was killing Christians. So whatever your past looks like that you feel like disqualifies you from being used by God, I want you to remember that what you did isn't who you are. and. There's a reason that testimonies have a before Jesus and an after Jesus. He's meant to change your life. So if you know God, you're a new creation. And that should be all the permission you need to now walk in the freedom and authority of who God has called you to be now and what He's called you to do. God wants us to do life together because we are better together. So connect with us on social media and join a community that encourages and prays for one another. We can't wait for you to join us there. I had to change the window that I looked out at my life mm. because it used to be that I would think, like take a verse like that, Romans mm. 8, 28. And I would say, okay, we know that God brings everything together. And I would look at a situation and think, well, this is not good. Yeah. And this doesn't feel good. Yeah. This is clearly not good. But then I changed the window I looked at and I think, okay, what I'll start with was what I know for sure. Yeah. And that is if God said it, I can build yes. my life on it. Yeah. Therefore, I'll take that promise and I'll look at what's going on that's not good. And I'll think, okay, this is not good right now, which means it's not done. Yes. yes. It's not over. Yes. It's not over. You know, I can't see it yet. I remember when I tried to 
persuade my husband and my son to do jigsaw puzzles with me, and they have zero interest. I buy them one every Christmas. I mean, and they're call still me. in the cupboard. Right, right. I would be your you girl. You would do it. I am your puzzle girl. Oh, okay, well, I, like I did one, and it was like neither of them helped me, you know, and I'm not bitter. So sorry. I've got the whole thing done, and there's one piece missing. Oh no! Do you know how hard that is when you've done? Oh, and it was oh. off, and Check I the searched. Dogs. Every, I know, <laughs> but do you know that I found that piece like three months later at the no. bottom of the dog's basket, well, oh. and he chewed it, so it didn't fit. But it was so interesting to me because I thought, here's the, I remember thinking, okay, Lord, this is not a spiritual situation, but I believe you're speaking yes. all the time Ooh, through yes. life. Ooh, for sure. And Ooh. it was like the missing pieces of my story, they're actually not missing. God has got all those Come pieces. On, yes. And for me, one of the ways that it became really clear was I've shared before, but my dad died by suicide when he was 34 and I was five. And because he took his own life, he was buried in an unmarked grave. And we had to leave town because it was like this big shame on this Christian family. You know, how can you be Christians? Please leave. And so as the years went on, it troubled me that nobody knew where my father was buried. And just maybe two years ago, for some reason, because my sister sent me a photo of where my mom is buried, and she's buried with her mom and dad. And there's their names and favorite scriptures. And I'm like, where's my dad? Wow. Yeah. And... And so I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, this doesn't make sense to me. My dad, before his brain injury, he loved you. Yeah. You know, he sang for you. He was amazing. And this just feels bad. Mm -hmm. So my sister comes over to stay with me while my brother-in-law goes off to play golf. And one evening, and this is not like my sister. She said to me, Sheila, if I could do anything for you, what would it be? Mm -hmm. And she's never in, in our lives wow. asked me a question like that. And I remember in that moment thinking, Lord, do I dare and I said to her, Francis, is there any way you could help me find out where our dad's buried? And she said, Sheila, I know where he's buried. Wow. I have the papers. When mom died, I was given the papers. And now we were able to go wow. and we have this beautiful memory of, mm -hmm. of my father. Wow. And, and I just think, you know, Lord, you held on to that piece for so long. But I'm thinking of the people who have got bits that don't make sense. Yep. But God has all those pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing about our story mm. that's lost. Yeah. And I think God is way more interested in who we're becoming in the process of mm -hmm. waiting yeah. than, than the actual what God does through us. Yeah. You know what just struck me about the story? It's like it's, it's resonating in my spirit. When you said the missing piece was found in the bottom of the dog basket chewed up. Yeah. And so many times the piece that makes sense is in the pain. Yeah, that's so it's true. It's in the mess, yeah. right? Like it's not It's not in the, the beauty and the, oh, yay. It's in the mess. Yeah. It's in the marriage that just was devastating and you cried and you prayed and you're like, Lord, what is this? Yeah. And he's now ministering to you in a way and allowing you to minister to other people mm -hmm. in a way that you couldn't if oh you didn't gosh, go yeah. through. You know it's what I mean? So and true. so it's it, it gets back to the fact that he promises he'll give us beauty for ashes. I think one of the things that can be hard to hold on to during difficult seasons is believing that God is holding all the pieces of your story. But one of the verses of Scripture that I really love is that it talks about that God was the one who began the good work in us and that He is the one who will bring it to completion. And to me, what that says is God knows what He's doing. I don't always understand His timing. His son is, I would like all the missing pieces to be put back in all at once. But over the years, because the thing is, as you get older as a believer, God has a track record with me. I've seen His faithfulness, and I trust that in His time, and honestly, maybe some pieces of our story will not understand until we're finally home, but I do know that because of Jesus, nothing is lost. We lost my dad in 2019 to cancer. It's such a man of faith. I mean, he believed literally to his last breath that he was gonna be healed, and whether that was physically on earth or in heaven. I mean, he just, his faith was just rock solid, couldn't shake it. Mm. And so when we had to say goodbye to him temporarily on this earth, for me, even though we had great faith that he was alive and well, I'm heartbroken yeah. because I've lost my dad on earth. So fast forward um, to 2023, when my brother-in-law got a stage four cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so we've been walking as a family through a de devastating, another mm -hmm. devastating cancer diagnosis. And his prognosis was really, really poor. And in recent weeks, we have had 
miracles happen in his health, miracles. And so we were talking about it as a family. And I said this as it came out, I was like, that resonates with me that we were beneficiaries of my dad's faith. Wow. That we wow. had we had the faith to believe for Shane's healing and to pray in a way and to do things in a way that no matter what the outcome, yes. we were operating yes. in a way of faith that my dad wow. taught us wow. by watching him. Gosh. Even though at the end of the day, he yeah. isn't on earth anymore. Yeah. We are beneficiaries yes. of mm. watching someone walk through a storm, yeah. walk through a situation with such great faith. We took that, got to build upon it and are now walking that out and yeah. seeing miracles. Yeah. And and so it, it really does matter. I, I say that because it's an important thing that our story is not just for us. Yeah. Mm. The way we walk it out, the faith that we yeah. walk yeah. in, the way that we speak about God, that we believe about God, it all matters because mm. there's beneficiaries of our so faith. Good. Absolutely. Sheila said, nothing is lost, mm -hmm. you know, and I do believe that we can use our story to empower someone mm -hmm. else. And you have people that may be even listening to our conversation right. today mm -hmm. thinking like, okay, why would God allow me yeah. to go through this? Mm -hmm. And it's about to take me out. Or I feel like it's taking mm -hmm. me out. Yeah. Part of it too is, is understanding what we're calling good. Mm -hmm. Because I think people would say, if God works all things out for good, then I'm going to call that hard thing good. Right. And I look at it like, mm. I don't think that we have to, like going back to this idea of wanting a testimony, right? So my, my husband and I, we pastor a church. So our kids are pretty well sheltered. Um, my son is desperately wanting a test testimony. So he's doing some things to try to get a testimony, Listen, right? Let me sit down with him. <laughs> let me tell but him. I don't know that we have to go through it to experience the good. I think the promise that God has made is that if and when mm -hmm. it happens, that he will work it together for yes. our good. Because I think about, I've talked about on the show many times about um, sexual abuse that I experienced as a child. Is that something that was good? Absolutely no. not. Mm -hmm. Would I wish it on anybody else? Absolutely Never. not. And at the same time, yeah. I realize that that, has now made room for the ministry that I have Absolutely. that I would not have asked for. Yeah. Trust me. Absolutely. If, if God yeah. would have been like, so here's the thing. You can either have a safe and loving home or you can go through all this and then tens of thousands of people will be blessed yeah. by it. It's like, I would be like, nope, safe and loving home. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. I think that, to me, that's the promise. It's right. like, yeah, it, yeah it, it sucks. It's bad. That's a good distinction. It's yeah, true. It's, it's, it's it sucks. Yeah. And yeah. I, I love that. I mean, I do believe that everything that we go through can be used. Yeah. I think every bit, every piece of my life can be used, you know, to help and to, you know, minister to, to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I know we're not exempt from trials because mm -hmm. all yeah. of us know that John 16, 33, yeah. in this world, we yes. are going to have, mm -hmm. you know, tribulation. So I know because we're in this world systems that yeah, we are going to experience different things here um, that the enemy wants to use to take us mm -hmm. out, but now Absolutely. God can use it you know, to be a redemptive story for someone else. You know, as someone who experienced abuse sexually, physically, verbally, emotionally as a child, I think for many years, especially the early years of my faith walk, I struggled because I was thinking, how could God let this happen to me? Like, how could God say that He loves me and then allow this pain to become part of my story? And I think what I realized is, number one, God loves us so much that He does not cause the pain, but He allows His love to redeem the pain. And I think that's where we have to recognize the goodness of God. Look, there are people who are fallen in every type of way, people who have all types of illnesses and sicknesses that hurt other people, and yet God loves us so much that He will see the hurt, He'll see the pain, and He can cause it to be for the good of us and other people. Listen, the pain is not good. The pain hurts, and yet God can make it a beautiful part of our testimony. John 10, 10, when it says, the thief comes to yeah. steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come yes, that they may have life, life and have it more abundantly. abundantly. I don't know if we focus enough on what is it, that, that whole important part is, but I have come. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to, I think when life mm, throws good. out the things that are just indescribably mm -hmm. terrible to talk about, mm -hmm. that it shouldn't happen to anybody, it makes us, if we're willing, focus on the for I have come. Mm -hmm. This is about 
that we have a Redeemer mm -hmm. who comes to take all those broken yes. parts. Yes. And though they don't make yeah. sense in the natural Absolutely. and they aren't fair or right even mm -hmm. in the natural, mm -hmm. for I have come, mm -hmm. means that we always can turn the focus on why did it happen? I don't know, yeah. but He has come to redeem it, yes. to, to give us abundant mm -hmm. life. That's a promise that yeah. when we, you were talking earlier about people who don't have that yeah. kind of faith, it's like, that's what grounds me in going, I don't have the answers to why the bad things have to happen. Right. But he tells us the thief is going to come. Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. going to come and he's going to try to he's steal going, and he's, he's going to come and he's going to try to destroy yes. and kill. Mm -hmm. But don't fear, I've come. Mm -hmm. I've come to give you a life that is yeah. more abundant. Mm -hmm. And it's that like, mm -hmm. I think this whole conversation is so important because for so many years, I saw God's faithfulness through how comfortable I was in my life. Ooh. <laughs> okay. And I yeah. viewed God's goodness yeah. through how good my situation was. Mm -hmm. And I think I was trusting, I was putting my definition in God's predictability, mm -hmm. not in His identity of He is good. That's good. If God is predictable, then He is faithful. God is not predictable. That's good. good. That was that Narnia. There's a quote from um, the C.S. Lewis books, The Chronicles of Narnia, where they say, He's not, he's not safe. He's he's not safe good. But he is good. I knew yes. you would know that quote. <laughs> and I remember hearing those wo words as a little girl and something sitting in my heart knowing that is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as I've grown up, it's not that I see my divorce and I go, I'm so glad I went through that. Yeah. You know how some people tell you their testimony and they're like, and I do it all again. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like hold that to no. yourself. Listen, yeah. is there no, an no. option B? I would oh, not true. go through my marriage yeah. again. That was traumatic. Yeah. 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 I remember this one night um, through the year of um, when I was married, I always felt like um, when I was a little girl, I overshared, which is probably not a surprise to people. I was always a little too honest. Mm -hmm. I never learned my lesson, thank God, honestly. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I remember being a little girl and being like, God, if you let me walk through things in life and you're with me, I'll talk about them. Mm. I remembered that prayer as like a 30-something year old and I was like, oh, that uh -huh. makes sense now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I remember um, thinking about the things that God has allowed me to walk through and just being so aware that when I tell my story, it unlocks somebody else's permission to tell theirs. Sure. And I think the connection we find is when we know not what we went through was okay, but that he was with us even in it. It reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Daniel 3. And they went through the fire. We always want to be saved from the fire. That's the faith we want. Yeah. But the truth is, is that when I walked through my divorce, um, the things that God burnt off me in the fire were necessary for what He had for me. I've been through many difficult seasons in my life. One in particular, I can remember asking so often the why question. Like, why did this have to happen? Why did it have to go this way? God, if you were there, couldn't you have stopped it? That that kind of thing. And I'm old enough to know that asking those kind of questions, there's never going to be an answer that's good enough. But I think what I was really searching for is I was searching for purpose in the pain. Like I needed to understand, is this going to be for something good? Could you have stopped it? Could you have done it another way? Is this the only way it could have been accomplished? These are all very normal ways to feel, but I did have to come to a point where I had to put that why question aside and I had to believe that there was purpose in the pain. God is right beside me. He's not happy that it happened. He didn't cause it to happen. But in the pain, if I will submit to Him, if I will let my heart be tended by Him, if, he will, if, if I will allow Him to carry me through that, He will show me His purpose. He will begin to light the steps of what the next thing is for me that will be making this thing a good thing. Not that the thing was good, but the purpose in it is good. And so, if you're in a hard season, I know the why question is maybe the go-to question, but if you could put it aside a little bit and begin asking God the what question. What do you have for me in this season? You will begin to feel purpose in the pain. I remember in that year, it was my birthday and it was the first time my husband had left me and what would come in the rest of the year would be multiple more times of these experiences mm. of being like, it shouldn't be this way. And I was on FaceTime to my sister, crying on the floor of my apartment that I was having to pack up, that I was mm. having to find someone else to take over the lease for, having zero idea of what my life would look like, let alone wanting it to be my birthday the next day. And I remember she said, turn the camera on. I said, I don't want to turn the camera on because I had been crying. And she said, turn the camera on. And I turned the camera on 
And I looked at my face and there was just, you know, mascara mm-hmm. everywhere and just red eyes. And she says, Elise, this is the worst birthday you will ever have. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, thanks for the encouragement. Right, right. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off again. She said, no, 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 listen to me. This is the worst birthday you will ever have. And that's the encouragement. And you're okay. She mm. said, God's got you. This is going to be okay. And I remember in that year, it wasn't the people that, because there were some that was like, God's going to save your marriage and everything's going to work mm-hmm. out. And this is going to, and you're going to have answers for everything. Those people honestly made me angry because mm-hmm. I didn't have answers. And I think I knew it wasn't mm-hmm. going to work. Mm-hmm. It was the people that said, God's got you and you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That that was what I held on to. Not the situation is going to be good. Mm -hmm. Not you're going to be grateful for what happened. But God has got you and you will be okay. And even here, he can rebuild. Mm -hmm. There's this verse, and I think it's Jeremiah 30, that says he rebuilds upon her ruins. And it often confused me, that verse. And I was talking about Israel, but... It often confused me because like, why would you not just start again, God? Like you said, let there be light and there was light. Why can't you say, let there be a clean slate and there will be a clean slate and you could start again? Why would you rebuild upon ruins? And I think it's so that we would know that God doesn't want to start again, that He wants to rebuild right here where you are in the ruins. He wants to rebuild Mm -hmm. upon the marriage that didn't work out. He wants to rebuild upon the diagnosis that took that family member that we begged God to heal. He wants to rebuild on the kids that don't look like they would ever come home or come back into relief. He wants to rebuild upon the things that we think discount our story Mm -hmm. so that we could know when He's done that this could have never been us Mm -hmm. in the first place. I often ask myself, God, why do you want to build upon my ruins? Like, why not start with the blank canvas? Why not get rid of all of that stuff? Because honestly, if I was God, I would. I would start again. But then I realize when I see God building on my life, not from a perfect slate, but upon the ruins that, if we're honest, often I've had a big hand in ruining I realize what grace is. I realize truly what it means to be strong when I am weak, to see the faithfulness of God in my life despite me, not because of me. When I see that God has built upon my ruins, it stops me from having one moment of thinking that I have created anything impressive in my life and fully understanding and realizing that God who got me here is gonna get me there. And He doesn't need my perfection. He just needs my surrender. Hi, everybody. I'm Sheila. I'm here with Nona, and we're answering your questions from behind the scenes here at Better Together. So, Nona, let me start with this question for you. Um, This is from a viewer on YouTube and sent us this question. Oh, good question. How can we know God's purpose for our life? Ooh, big question. This is like the million dollar question I think everyone wrestles with. I would say just a few principles. So one of the ways that you know God's purpose for your life is you will be uniquely graced Mm -hmm. for what God created you for. Like there will be something that you do that energizes you that you could do all day long, like because you were created to do it. Whereas other people would try to do what you do and they may get exhausted or frustrated or overwhelmed. I think one of the keys to purpose is that you are uniquely graced for it. And then the second key to purpose, I think is that God, it's like he equips you to see a need that others don't see. Or maybe it's one of those things where it's like you tell other people, somebody should do this thing. Mm but it's because you have something within you that God placed in you that makes you uniquely uh, attuned to that thing. Those are two keys I would offer. That's good. God has used what I thought would be my ending, not only to grow me and heal me in deeper ways than ever before, but to also help other women realize that they think the thing that's gonna take them out is actually only the very start of their story too. God always wants to use the fires that we have walked through to go back and help other people still in the fire. Don't despise 
those places in your past that hurt. Realize that God wants to use them. I think my life changed when the Lord began writing my story, when I truly surrendered my will to Him. My will is my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions. So it's a holistic idea that every part of me, the things I think, the things I want to do, the desires I have, I'm putting at His feet. And when I began to understand what obedience really was, meaning I'm going to find out what God's idea for me is versus my idea, then I believe that's when I really started walking in the plans and purposes that the Lord had for me. You were speaking of um, Joseph before. It's one of my favorite stories mm. because the amount of things that boy had to go through, oh, <laughs> just because he had a dream, <laughs> things that God did even through the pain that he went through. And I remember looking at this story and studying it for a sermon I was writing and God showed me something that I had never seen in a season like he does, that I didn't even know I would need it mm -hmm. a few weeks later. Mm -hmm. And it was this idea that God is constantly, like Romans 8, 28, not yeah. taking it out of context. He is constantly working for our good. Mm -hmm. He is constantly reworking, rewriting. Mm -hmm. He's the greatest editor of all time. And when we give him the pen of our story, he's the one that writes the rest of it and makes it good. Doesn't mean that the wow. moments are are good, it means that He'll make them good. Mm -hmm. And that instead of killing and stealing and destroying us, it will come to life. And yeah. I remember studying this story and and in it, when Joseph's brothers hear the dream and they plot to kill him, said, let's sell him. And at that moment, Genesis 37, uh, verse 25, it says, when they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of uh, Ishmaelites coming from Gilead mm -hmm. with their camels bearing a bunch of stuff I cannot pronounce. <laughs> and oh, it was Judah that says, what do we gain from killing our brother? And so they sell him uh, to the Midianites slash the Ishmaelites. That mm -hmm. tribe was interchangeable. And I go back in the genealogy of Joseph, mm -hmm. whose dad was Jacob, yep. whose dad was Isaac, yep. whose That's dad was Abraham. Abraham. Yeah. Joseph's great grandfather was Abraham and arguably Abraham's greatest mistake, greatest pain yeah. was the birth of Ishmael, was the messiest moment when he tried to make God's promise come together with his own performance, which mm -hmm. we could go around the room and share yeah. even more stories For of sure. that. I'm sure all of us, I know I can, when I have gone, okay, God, that's the promise. Let me go and make it happen. Mm -hmm. And then an Ishmael is born out of that. And even in Abraham's moment of taking God's promise and making it happen on his own and making that mistake, that moment of what he would think would be shame, the moment that he probably thought God wouldn't be able to use this. Let's try and pretend that never happened in my story. Let's let those ruins lie and let's yeah. rebuild just with Isaac. Even in that moment, generations later, it would be that tribe, the Ishmaelites, <laughs> that would save Joseph from death and actually transport him to his destiny ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I think in those moments, God, even in the heartbreak of being rejected by the person that was meant to love me, mm -hmm. even in the confusion when I moved from Sydney to Los Angeles and was in this big city and felt so lost and so unseen and wondering if I'd made the biggest mistake of my life, even in a new season now of seeing the redemption of God, which is still really messy. Mm -hmm. I think back to my Ishmael moments. Oh my God, you weaved it all into the story. Yeah, You weave it all into mm -hmm. the story. And it's one of my favorite things because someone might be listening and they're like, yeah, but you don't have my story. Yeah, but I caused my pain. It mm -hmm. wasn't that a husband left. It was that I left mm -hmm. or it wasn't mm -hmm. that I just got a, a random diagnosis. It was my life that led right. to this diet. Whatever it is, even in those moments, I come back to God wants to rebuild yeah. on the ruins. When you said that he rebuilds on her ruins, if you ever visited um, the site where there was something built on top of ruins, there are always artifacts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the artifacts are reminders. Takeaway for me is don't lose sight of the artifacts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because trials will come. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Challenges are going to come. The truth is, we ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Like we think, I agree. we're like, I oh, agree. I've, I've, I've experienced the worst pain ever. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Yeah, I agree. But the artifacts remind yes. us 
that he is faithful to rebuild. And I think what we have to do is we have to keep an inventory yeah. of the artifacts. That's like exactly. what, what has God been faithful in mm -hmm. so that when that thing happens, I can remember. I had a really, really challenging childhood. Uh, my mom has some mental illness. My father passed away shortly before my second birthday. And I'm an only child. And so the pain that I was forced to experience throughout my childhood, I experienced it by myself. And I will tell you, that created cracks and crevices and devastation in my heart. It created ruins in my heart. But where I see the redeeming power of God is in my children today. My 14-year-old son, my 10-year-old son, they are so safe and secure in my love for them, the protection of them, um, the way that I'm there for them, that I can see how God has built love on the ruins of my pain. And the memories that I have from my childhood of being neglected, overlooked, talked down to, those are artifacts that remind me just how powerful God is. Because I can love and speak life over my children today out of the same mouth that my mother would have used to speak death. That is the power of redemption. That's what I'm talking about. We wanna pass over the fact that God was faithful with Abraham's mm -hmm, moment, mm -hmm. but we can't. You can't overlook those moments, otherwise you will not see that God will turn this. And I'm not saying that we put a Band-Aid on a bullet hole and say like, be all better, here's a scripture. Yeah. Not at all. I'm saying in the deepest moments of pain, in the worst ruins, God rebuilds. And if we're not being, taking our thoughts captive, like the yeah. word tells us to, and saying, but I know he was faithful in this. In this last season, I felt like God was asking me to give up and surrender literally every area that I had found comfort in mm -hmm. and finally felt like I was finding my mm -hmm. feet in because he had something new that I didn't know what it was. When you willingly put yourself in a season of waiting, that's a whole different thing when God forces it on you because it's so, like for me, it was so scary. And I had to create a journal of all the ways I had seen God come through in the past that's good. because I went back yeah. to it every so, single day. I mean, day. I hope they, they write that down because exactly. that was very good. They would just write down some things, keep a journal so you Have won't it in forget. Front of your eyes. So you won't forget. You won't and I think forget. It's also important, I think, to say this stinks. Yeah, yeah. Right. I don't I like think, this. I, don't I want think this. it's okay to yes. to name that. It's okay to uh, be this, okay this with stinks. not being okay. Yes, yeah. it's okay mm -hmm. for a minute. Be because yep. I think this is what I see when I got that picture of the ruins. I think if the canvas was blank slate, mm -hmm. whatever, there would be something in us that could, because we don't always remember like we should, there would be something in us that could think that we could do this on our own mm -hmm. again. <laughs> the ruins are like His grace. Yeah. His grace is sufficient in my weakness, He's yeah. strong. Yeah. His power is made strong through my weakness. Yeah. How am I going to remember that His power is made strong in me if the ruins aren't there to remind me that I'm exactly. only rebuilding because of His grace? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't do it in my own strength. In fact, to the ones out there who have the mess they're in is because of their own, mm -hmm. they, they have immediate recognition. Yeah. I got here in my own strength. Mm -hmm. I can't, I'm not gonna be able to get out of this in my own strength. It's like we can't forget that when we rebuild, it's because it's His grace that yeah, we're rebuilding yeah. upon. Yeah. But it's okay in the place that you're at if you need to just take a moment to call it sticky. Call it what it I is. Think that's important. I, it, I think it's important. Call it what it is. Because I, I don't really know the authentic heart, like the person who's really like, God, I'm going to trust you in this. I don't know that you actually can really move to the next place if you haven't settled that yes. where you are has been hurtful yes. Yes. And, and I feel blindsided yes. and I didn't expect this in my life. I feel, you know, like, especially if you're looking at others mm -hmm. and their life seems really great. Right. You know, that's hard. Yeah. It's yeah. okay to call this that hard. Good. Absolutely. I picked up a book in a, an old bookstore one day and it was called um, Markings. It was by a guy called Dag Hammarskjöld and he used to be the secretary of the United Nations and he had an apartment in New York. And he kept a diary beside his bed of his journey with the Lord after he came to faith. And one of the things that challenged me the most was he said toward the end of his life, he said, for everything that has been, thank you. And for everything that will be, yes. And at first I struggled with that because I thought, how am I supposed to be thankful for things like, like my dad dying by suicide? And how do I know what I'm saying yes to? You know, is, is that gonna mean something that might affect my, my son? But honestly, Believing that God is good and that God is in control 
and that God is sovereign has made it so much easier for me to keep taking one step after the next, believing that God, even one of the Psalms, it says, and if you take the wrong path, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, no, this is the way, walk in it. God has got you. That's the stuff that we come to Jesus with. Yeah. You were talking earlier about the puzzle piece. I think that so often, and we would all have an area in our life currently right now, this is not all the stories of all the times before. I'm sure we all have a moment and an area of our life right now where there are puzzle pieces that don't fit, mm -hmm. where there are a puzzle piece that's just completely missing or one that we have found at the bottom of the dog basket chewed up. Yeah. And I think the first step is coming to God with the pieces mm -hmm. and saying, in my hands, it's just going to stay broken. Yeah. It's just going to not fit together. But this is really messy and I don't know what to do. And I think if there is an action step from today, it is rather than running from him, bring it to him mm -hmm. in the questions, in the pain, the bitterness of it all, because that's what it feels like sometimes. This is not fair. If you had been here, this area of my life wouldn't have died. This divorce wouldn't have happened. This wouldn't have happened. But I'm going to give these pieces to you. And I think at the outset of this week, when we're talking about how God redeems our story, I would love to be able to do that with you ladies, is just to bring those pieces mm. to Him yeah. uh, with the people that are watching today. So can yeah. we pray? Yeah. Yeah. God, I thank You so much that You are the great Redeemer. The Word calls You that You are our Redeemer. And Lord, there are so many areas of our life that we don't understand, so many pieces that don't feel like they, they fit together, so many parts of our story that we don't see how they'll fit in. And God, it hurts and it's painful and it's messy. And in the same breath, we remind our soul that you know how to fit it together. You know how to bring about the good from what is currently bad. So I pray for every single person that is engaged in this, that is watching this right now, that is under the sound of my voice. Lord, I remind them and I remind myself that You are the Redeemer. You are the one that flung the stars into the sky and You are in Your bigness. You have never lost sight of us. God, we have never for a moment been outside of Your care and outside of Your control. So Lord, I thank You. And I pray that You would weave all of the areas of our story that don't make sense and You would weave them all into Your story. God, we may not one day have all the answers even, but we're not, we're not asking for that. God, I pray just for today that You would give us peace even now, the kind of peace that goes beyond our need for understanding and that we would watch the faithfulness that is who You are as You put the pieces together and You, God, rebuild in our ruins. We give them to You and we commit it to You in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Connect with us on social media and let us know how our team can pray for you. When I put the pieces of my story in the hands of God, I surrender it. And that's actually a really helpful technique, though not easy to do. Trust me, there's been many times where I haven't. But the times where I've kept the pieces of my story to myself, it's only ever resulted in striving, in me trying to perform my way out of my past, in me trying to prove something to people that God never asked me to prove. But when I put the pieces of my story, when I surrender them to God, here's what I've learned. I learned that He begins to write my story, that when He takes the pen, his story and the chapters that follow, the chapters that I thought would be the end, I find out that they were just the beginning, that they were the foundation that God was laying for what He wanted to do, that, that when I surrender my pieces of my story to Him, what He begins to construct is a story of grace, a story where the loose ends, they're not tied up, but they're tied in to His story. It's a way better story than I could ever write. I've had letters before from young women who say, I would love to be used by God. I would love to have a ministry. But if you knew my story, you would know that I'm not qualified. But what I know about the Lord is He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people who are completely surrendered to Him. And honestly, when you give your past to the Lord, you'll be amazed how God can use the very things that you thought 
would break you, the very things that God will use to touch other people's lives. God's light shines beautiful through the broken places. You know, the Word of God tells us that when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. It says that old things pass away, and behold, we are made new. Our past is literally behind us when we are in Christ. And that's why we have to leave it where it is, because God is calling us into our future.